that later on, something that may seem just to be absolutely insurmountable, seems relatively easy because you are used to it. And she said, well, the people who got me involved, they found a voice and a strength that, that I never knew I had. And in my sense is that there's you know, all sorts of good people out there. And then, you know, my sense is, I guess probably you folks are already engaged, so you've already passed that boundary, most of you. But there are all sorts of people out there who you know who are your friends and neighbors and co-workers who are troubled by the direction of this country, troubled by the direction of the world, would like to see a wiser course, and yet don't feel that they have the right to speak out. I mean, now, that, that, you know, that attitude and that intimidation is it's not accidental. It's crafted by a culture that talks a lot about democracy in the abstract, but it really intimidates people in, in, you know, in, in the specific. You know, that, you know, that's why you don't believe where the stories growing up in the schools. You know, and then you get an administration, and we have a, you know, we replaced Johnny Ashcroft with, you know, Gonzalez, the, you know, tortures, of, you know, the conventions against torture are quaint artifacts. Uh, I'm not sure that's much of an improvement. Uh, but, you know, but this tenor that says, if you dare speak out against us, you're an ally of terrorism, that still remains. And that's intimidating for people. And part of what we have to do is to, I mean, you know, it's a very, very deliberate attempt. I mean, you know, when ran those ads against Max Cleal in the center from Georgia, who lost two legs in an arm in Vietnam, and they said he wasn't patriotic enough, and they posed photos of Assad Hussein and Bin Laden and did the same thing with Tim Johnson, who nearly did get reelected. It was the only senator who actually has a son fighting in Iraq with our forces, who would also served actually in Afghanistan and Bosnia. Um, you know, that's a very deliberate attempt at bullying. Part of what we have to do is to begin to name that. I mean, it is a shame that. John Kerry did not during that electoral, you know, that election campaign. He had one line at the convention, which got more applause as far as I could tell than anything else he said, which is that the flag belongs to all of us. And then he dropped it. You know, and I, and I think if he made it a conscious issue, he might be president today. But I think we have to be the ones to say, excuse me, um, part of the crisis of our time is we've got, we have a friend who was in the Nixon administration and hired G. Gordon Liddy and went to jail for water. And as he was being sentenced, he said to the judge, you know, we almost destroyed democracy. We were so certain we were right. We were so certain that the stakes were so high. You know, we were so, we were so arrogant. And, you know, he apologized. And he said, you know, that the people of power now are, if anything, more ruthless and more willing to destroy democracy, more reckless. And, and, and you know, so we have to take that seriously and name it as an issue. And at the same time, talk about what real democracy means and encourage people to stand up nonetheless. I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to settle for silence because silence breeds silence and at the same time, courage breeds courage. And that means finding in the very difficult ways to speak out wherever we are, whatever context it is. Um, precisely in those situations where we might be able, you know, we might draw heat. And sometimes it's hard, but I think we have to recognize that it's worth it, partly because when, when, we're, when we're speaking out, we do two things. We're asking people to step back and think about what's going on with our society. And we're also trying to bring them into a larger stream of involvement. And that's very important. In Hommel's essay, he talks about something else which I found very valuable. She was describing a point where they were trying to free some political prisoners. There's a circulating petition now. Hobble himself was in and out of jail uh, repeatedly once for almost four years during that time. And you know, I, I think we have something of this administration or something created a culture of intimidation here, but you know, believe me, it's nothing like what they had you know, communist Czechoslovakia. I mean, but I don't want to go there, but we have a very long way to go before we would get to that point. And so it was really a situation where if you spoke out, you, you know, you could be just thrown in jail, cavalierly. And how people who were, I'm sorry, even people who were supposedly on the same side, we're sort of mocking the petition. And they're saying, oh, this is exhibitionistic, it's indulgent, it's not going to do any good, it's futile. Because uh, probably the best the literary figure in Czechoslovakia is a novelist named Milan Kundera, who wrote a novel in her film called Unbearable Lightness of Being. And he was safely in exile in Paris, so there wouldn't have been any personal cost to him. But he refused to sign the petition and just 
condescended to them. And, and it was interesting, Hall was looking back on it about a dozen years later, and he said, you know, we did not actually succeed in freeing any of those prisoners. So, on some level, the critics were right. And it's interesting that the, the tones of the critics, to me, reminded me of things that are said of activists here in the United States. You know, you're just trying to get attention, you're being indulgent, this isn't going to do any good enough. I've heard all of the same things here. He says, you know, but I wouldn't actually say that we failed. Because when those people got out of jail, they said that our efforts allowed them to keep going. Because they weren't alone. And, and, and nothing kills hope more than the sense of being alone. And a culture will always try and convince you that you're completely alone. Another reason that, you know, that engaged communities like this are so important. And he said, you know, those people knew that they weren't alone, so they were able to keep acting, and they were able to keep resisting, and they were in jail, and they got out of jail. He said, not only that, but the people who signed that petition, they didn't stop there. They went on to put on dissident plays, play dissident music, teach differently in the classroom, have different conversations, in every possible way challenge the regime. He said, there is so much happening now that where 10, 15 years ago they just have slapped everybody in jail, there's too many of them, they can't jail everybody. And he had absolute faith that it would bring the regime down, and in fact it did, three years later in that nonviolent, what they call the Velvet Revolution. So if you look at that, it's very interesting because there's a lesson that I actually had not thought about until I read Hobbes' story, and that is that when we're working for change, we're doing two things. We're trying to take on an immediate task, free political prisoners, win an election, stop a war, have an environmental you know, fight to save some watershed, whatever it is. And obviously, the stakes are huge often, the consequences are immense, and whether we win or lose is terribly consequential. But, we're also doing something else, and that is we're trying to broaden the stream of those involved. And this friend of mine, Vincent Harding, is a historian and theologian out of Denver, and he, he says, he has a book called Women's Civil Rights, and called There's a River. And I like that phrase, because he talks about a river of social justice involvement. I mean, he's a theologian who traces it back to the biblical prophets and looks forward to the future. He says, you know, everybody who works for justice is part of that river, past and present. And what I like about that is, is that it allows us to, not, not only do we, do we feel a community of people in the present, but also in the past and also in the future. So we're part of something much larger, and that's very powerful. It also suggests that if we can expand that river, that the, the, in itself that's worthwhile. And so if you look at the case you know, of Havel and his compatriots, they did not succeed in freeing those prisoners. But, so you could say they failed, but they did succeed in expanding the boundaries of that river, and they ultimately succeeded in bringing down that regime that you know, all the observers said you know, there's no way that that would even be possible and bring it down you know, without the loss of a single life. And so, I think that if we recognize that, that teaches us something important. I mean, even if you look at something like the Rosa Parks story, go back to that and think for a moment about who brought Rosa Parks into involvement. And we know that it's primarily her husband, Raymond Parks, he was an NAACP activist before her, although she was influenced a little bit by some, uh, some Quakers at school, the school that she went to high school. And then I asked the question, though, which is, who brought Raymond Parks into involvement? I don't know the answer. It's not any book I've read. But you figure that somebody, anonymous, some anonymous person, in the late 30s or like the early 1940s, brought another anonymous person in, named Raymond Parks, who would later bring in his wife to be, who a dozen years later would go on to make, for an action that everybody worldwide acknowledges as a sort of turning point of history. And yet I would argue that it is possible that if that anonymous person had never acted in whatever way they did to bring Raymond Parks into involvement, that we would never have had that moment on the Montgomery bus. So, if you think of it that way, I find that very empowering. 